It is a pleasure and an honor to welcome you to this public conversation on voting rights and the perilous march to freedom. I invite you to settle in and get ready for a lively discussion designed to probe our deepest truths and highest values. The Partnership to Renew the Shaw 54th Memorial is a project of the National Park Service, the Friends of the Public Garden, the City of Boston, and the Museum of African American History on Beacon Hill and Nantucket. This partnership is dedicated to providing the restoration work necessary to ensure the monument's longevity for generations to come. This partnership also represents an important effort to recognize not only Robert Good Shaw and the members of the 54th Regiment, but also the bigger and longer fight for self-determination and self-emancipation for Black Americans. The fathers, sons, husbands, nephews, cousins, and brothers who made up the 54th Massachusetts Infantry were bold dreamers, strategists, and movement makers. Their decision to enter the Civil War's front line was about demanding more from a country that was determined to give them less. This group of way-making men marched to war for a country that still had not recognized them as citizens, as fully human, or as worthy of the right to vote. But they persisted. And in so doing, they joined a long list of Massachusetts freedom fighters, including Prince Hall, the founder of Free Black Masonry in the United States, and Elizabeth Freeman, affectionately known as Mumbet, an enslaved Black woman who refused to live in a state that professed freedom, but did not recognize hers. As many of you know, in 1781, Miss Freeman sued the state of Massachusetts for her freedom and won. Her case would pave the way for the state's abolition of slavery in 1783. So while St. Gaudens Memorial was new when it was unveiled to the world in 1897, Black Americans fight for freedom in this country was by this time entering its third century. And while St. Gaudens bronze sculpture is widely celebrated for showing the fortitude, individuality, and collective commitment of the 54th, his sculpture is also praiseworthy for its ability to capture the freedom of movement and dignity of these men. They are not posing, stopped, or waiting. They are moving and inviting us to join them in pushing, pushing, pushing beyond limits, beyond racial segregation, beyond narrow patriotisms, beyond token and cliched notions of manhood, and beyond the possessive logics of white supremacy. You can almost see them walking steadily, slowly, but steadily to confront unknown dangers at Fort Wagner, yet buoyed by the movement of their own legs and feet to carry them freely. Francis Ellen Harper Watkins, renowned writer, feminist, and good troublemaker, captured these bad brothers in her own words. She called them bearers of a high commission to break each brother's chain. With hearts aglow for freedom, they bore the toil and pain. So tonight, please hold these bearers of a high commission in your heart and recommit to the unfinished racial reckoning that these brothers died for. And most of all, please vote, vote, vote. Tonight, we are exceedingly blessed to have a distinguished panel of contemporary freedom fighters who are undaunted by the urgent work of securing justice for all of us right now. As we, to, as we prepare to hear from them, I would like to first introduce our moderator. Karen Holmes Ward is the Director of Public Affairs and Community Services and the host 
and executive producer of CityLine, WCVB-TV's award-winning magazine program, which features the accomplishments, concerns, and issues facing people of color in Boston and its suburbs every Sunday at noon on Channel 5. Thank you, Karen, for your leadership and commitment to public service that makes a difference. You have been an, an essential partner and steward of these dialogues since 2019. You are also a personal shero and inspiration for me. Uh, it's great to welcome you back to the mic tonight. Now over to you, Karen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you. It's good to be uh, on this platform with you this evening. Good evening, everyone. And I'm honored to serve as your moderator as we continue this series of community conversations to renew the Shaw 54th Memorial and the dialogue on race. The story of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw and the mighty 54th Massachusetts Glory Regiment is familiar to many from the Hollywood dramatization for which Denzel Washington won an Academy Award. The much deeper true story of the regiment and the bronze tribute to them on Boston Common, sculpted by Augustus St. Gaudens, continues to evolve and exemplify the complexities of American history, especially as it pertains to who we call our heroes and how we commemorate their legacy. The Shaw 54th Memorial has served as a beacon of hope and a rallying point for conversations about race, justice, and human rights. The men understood that while serving a country that did not accept them as equal, their service was critical to gaining the right to vote, the best hope of securing equality for all. While they joined the Union Army and went south to fight, George Ruffin, the first African-American judge in the United States, began organizing black men in Massachusetts and beyond to be ready to vote when the time came. The Shaw 54th is the first civic monument to pay homage to the heroism of black soldiers and is considered the nation's greatest piece of public art. At the time of our August dialogue, the memorial had just been removed from Boston Common for restoration and a lot has happened since then. Today, the work is underway on the bronze panel at the Conservators Studio in Woburn and on the marble and granite at the Stone Conservators in Lenox. Meanwhile, reconstruction of the memorial's foundation and reinforcement of the plaza continues on the common. While the memorial is offsite, make sure you check out the exhibit installed along the construction fencing on the common that explores the story of the Civil War, the 54th Regiment, the creation of the memorial, and the partnership to renew it. For regular updates about the renewal project and upcoming programs, visit shaw54thmemorialrestoration.org. Now, before we meet our panelists, please understand your role as our audience members. First, we ask that you take a moment to share on social media now and during the program. Invite friends to join us for tonight's interactive dialogue on Facebook at Friends of the Public Garden. And you can look for it in the chat. Second, we invite you to add your voice to the conversation. On Facebook, post questions and reactions as comments. In Zoom, post a question or comment in the chat. Now to find the chat button, scroll over the bottom of the screen and click on the chat icon. If you're on a phone or a tablet, you'll want to tap on your screen, click the three dots in a row and select chat. And reminder, we're recording tonight's session. This recording will only capture the video and audio of our speakers, but it will save your chats. So please keep your thoughts on our topic, voting rights and the perilous march to freedom and honor our request for this conversation to remain nonpartisan and respectful of others. And finally, please keep each question or comment under 25 words. We're gonna thread your questions throughout the program and include as many as time allows. Now, let's meet our special guests. Cheryl Clyburn Crawford is the Executive Director of Mass Vote and First Vice President of the NAACP Boston Branch. Rasan D. Hall, is the director of the Racial Justice Program for the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts. 
Both Mass Vote and ACLU are nonpartisan organizations which advocate for equal rights, including voting equity. And Martha S. Jones is the Society of Black Alumni Presidential Professor, the Professor of History at the Johns Hopkins University, and author of the newly released book, Vanguard, How Black Women Broke Barriers, Won the Vote, and Insisted on, equally, on, on Equality for All. More information about each of our participants can be found online at Shaw 54th Memorial Restoration.org. And now, tonight's first question, which goes to everyone What is your most memorable voting experience? We'd like to ask the audience to please enter your answers in the chat while we invite Cheryl, Rasan, and then Martha to respond. Cheryl, let's start with you. Don't forget everyone, the right to vote is considered our fundamental basis of democracy. Cheryl? Hi, good evening everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you Karen so much for the space and time. Um, memorable voting experience. I think one of my most memorable um, of voting experiences was in 2006 when Deval Patrick was running for governor. I was a campaign manager for Willie Mae Allen running for state representative at the time. And I was making my rounds on election day and stopped over at Mildred Avenue Community Center. They had ran out of ballots. Oh my goodness. It was like, seriously? People waited for hours in line for ballots to be delivered so that they could vote. We were doing everything in our power to make sure people stayed in line because once eight o'clock came, if you stepped out in line, you could not get back in line. I thought to myself, this is absolutely unheard of. And I questioned, aren't they supposed to have a ballot for every registered voter? This is when I really, when I realized that voter suppression is happening in very subtle ways in Massachusetts, this being one of them. Mm. Very interesting story. Rasan, uh, tell us about your first experience. What do you recall? Um, I think instead of my first experience, I think I'd like to talk about one of my more memorable mm -hmm. uh, experiences. And my most memorable experience was the time that I took both of my adult children to go vote with me. Uh, for so long, uh, I had been pouring into them the value and importance of being civically engaged. And we always wonder what our children will do and whether or not they will listen to us. And maybe a lot of our fears are based on the reflections of who we were uh, as young people. But fortunately, uh, both my son and daughter took what I had shared with them and my wife and I had shared with them to heart uh, and were intentional about making sure that they got registered to vote. And for me, and my son at the time, his first experience voting was a very powerful uh, experience voting because for him, it was an opportunity to vote on something that was specific to him because a trans rights ballot question was on there. So to be a part of that experience, to vote as a family and to have his first experience be something that was so deeply meaningful for him was something that stood out in my mind. Okay, Martha, let me ask you, what uh, has been your most memorable voting experience? It's such a good question um, and you've got my wheels turning, but I think um, for me, um, I spent um, a number of years uh, living uh, in Southeast Michigan where um, on election day, um, I had to cast my ballot early so that I could be um, a poll watcher. Um, and someone who participated in ensuring that as many um, voters as um, could and as many voters as um, showed up at the polls got to cast their ballots. And there was a year, I think it was likely 2004, um, where I, maybe not unlike Cheryl, I, I, I had my first close up encounter with voter suppression um, with um, folks who came to the polls um, with the clear intention of slowing things down, of 
um, mucking up the works and discouraging folks from um, waiting in those lines and having their turn um, to make their own choices. Um, I was someone who um, brought my lawyer's sensibilities to that moment and I think we prevailed, but it was a chilling encounter because I recognized that it was an experience that was being um, mirrored in many local polling places across the country and gave me a, a strong sense of what we mean when we say, um, when it comes to voting rights in the country, we have to always be um, not only committed, but vigilant. Um, we have some comments in the chat. Meryl says the first time she voted absentee in college just after um, the voting age was lowered to 18, was her most memorable experience. Liza says her first vote, 1980, Carter Reagan Anderson, deep discussions about the impact of independent candidates and something specific to Massachusetts. I saw Carl Cruz comment earlier that the first time he voted was when he had a chance to vote for Senator Edward Brooke for U.S. Senate. Uh, of course, very historic here in uh, Massachusetts. As I said earlier, the right to vote is considered fundamental to our democracy, our system of representative government, yet from the nation's establishment, the right to vote, to have a voice in governance has not been accorded equally to all. When Shaw and the 54th marched out of Boston on May 28th, 1863, they were marching off to fight for a country that did not recognize them as full or legitimate members of society. Martha, uh, I'd like to ask you, I wonder if you might talk with us about race and civil rights in the decades leading up to and including the Civil War and share some of the factors that pave the way for passage of the 14th and 15th amendments. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and of course, these are men um, whom we remember precisely because um, they um, act um, with extraordinary courage and at uh, almost unspeakable risk um, at a critical moment in that story. Um, but it is a story that I think in some ways begins, for example, as we heard from Carolyn Crockett um, with figures like Elizabeth Freeman, um, Black Americans who um, hear, who read, who encounter the ideals of the new nation, uh, the new constitutions, um, and through their own life challenges and circumstances, including the blight of slavery, are prepared to uh, test um, to breathe life into um, and to insist on a critical reading and rereading of some of the most foundational principles, um, such as that, that all men, and we will say parenthetically women, um, are created equal. Um, my story um, picks up um, and becomes pointed by the 1820s when um, Black American communities, now free communities, are growing um, in the North, but also in the um, border cities um, in the American South, in the port cities of the American South. Um, here um, now former slaves, um, free people um, are asking new questions about who they are with respect to the law, with respect to the constitution, with respect to the nation itself. Um, are they citizens? Do they have political rights? And what we discover as we follow um, the many scenes and the um, varied debates that unfold over the course of um, the many decades before this moment in May of 1863 is that Black Americans um, live with a sort of um, specter of uncertainty, of doubt, of question. Um, they live under the blight of Black laws um, that uh, mark them as distinct um, in local courthouses, um, at the polls and more. Um, they live with serious um, uh, debates over whether or not they are citizens of the United States at all. Um, and yet um, they are folks unlike Elizabeth Freeman in the 1780s who are prepared um, not only to challenge um, discrimination and marginalization, but are prepared to offer up a new theory of citizenship 
um, into which Black Americans will step forcefully in the 1860s. And that is the theory of birthright citizenship. It is still the regime in which, um, with which we live today, um, but it is early Black Americans in the decades before the Civil War who not only um, refine the terms of what it might be to be a birthright citizen, but claim their belonging as people born in the United States and hence citizens of the United States, um, even in the face of profound doubt. What's so important about this scene in May 1863 and those that surround it, of course, is that a revolution is being wrought and it is a revolution that will, yes, um, ultimately by the terms of the 13th Amendment and slavery in the United States. Um, but it is importantly a revolution that will affirm the claim that Black Americans had long been leveling against their individual states and against the nation. That claim to birthright citizenship will become enshrined in the 14th Amendment when it is uh, added to the Constitution in 1868, now taking a principle long held up by Black Americans and making it a principle that works for all Americans. Um, yes, in the critical years after the Civil War, but those of us today still benefiting from that regime that Black Americans play. There's no, that put in place, there's no question, um, but that um, the men, um, and the women who support them in the years of the Civil War um, lay a foundation for that bold claim um, by way of their valor, by way of their service to the nation, and then by way of political rhetoric um, in the wake of the war um, that expressly proposes a trade um, between military valor and service and the claim to citizenship um, I hope we'll talk more about the ways in which that creates an unevenness for black men and women when it comes to political rights going forward. But there's no question that the moment we've focused on this evening, May of 1863, sits at the doorstep of a profound revolution when it comes to the citizenship, political rights, and more of black Americans. I'm gonna ask Rasan and Cheryl to talk with us about ways in which milestone uh, amendments sin since that time and uh, subsequent civil and voting rights laws uh, have played into the nation's civil rights landscape today. Rasan? Oh, sure, thank you. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I think about the, the significance of these amendments and how they transformed the landscape uh, of our country in generally positive ways. Um, uh, birthright citizenship, of course, the abolishing of slavery, uh, the right to vote. These are all significant cornerstones of how we understand society to be and granting significant rights for formerly enslaved people. But one of the things that I think uh, has been problematic is with the 13th Amendment. To the extent that it uh, abolished slavery, there still remained a provision that allowed uh, for slavery for those who were duly uh, convicted of a crime. And that serves as the basis uh, for the criminalization of Black people uh, as a form of social control that has continued to exist throughout this country, this uninterrupted thread uh, from slavery to the Reconstruction, then post-Reconstruction era up through um, uh, Jim Crow, uh, the war on poverty, the war on drugs, and now mass incarceration. And when you think about voting rights and in the states that have felony disenfranchisement, uh, the impact of the 13th Amendment um, it, it stands out. And so the, we have always uh, had to fight. And with every significant move forward, uh, with the swing of the pendulum, it has swung back. Reconstruction, post-Reconstruction era, the, uh, the Obama presidency and the post-Obama uh, presidency era. And so we are in one of those moments of the pendulum swinging back and we should continue to look to some of these landmark moments uh, to not only inform us of what lie ahead of us, uh, but also to inspire us uh, of how we need to continue to fight. Cheryl, do you have any reflections you'd like to share on say the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965 in uh, context and, and as part of this discussion? You unmute my doll. Yep. 
bound to happen once, sorry. Um, I think about the 14th and 15th Amendment as it was not fought by you know Abraham Lincoln or the politicians of that day. They were fought by the abolitionists like William Lloyd Garrison, Frederick Douglass, and Sojourner Truth, right? Um, those who took to the pulpit and made their stances known to all. They were fought for by Harriet Tubman who risked her life by leading countless slaves to freedom. And they were fought by the men of the Shaw 54th Regiment and the thousands upon thousands of black union soldiers who died in the hopes of attaining freedom. freedom. The 14th and 15th amendment proved critical not only for what they achieved, but for what they proved. They proved that activism works. Uh, they proved that you can be unfathomably large interest groups like slave traders and politicians and achieve your cause. They proved that future reforms like the Voting Rights Act was possible. Um, yet the, they proved that achieving such acts would be incredibly difficult, costing decades of work and countless lives risked. That proved true today. You know, right now, like we at Mass Vote are trying to make voting rights easier and more accessible for Black voters and all disadvantaged voters. We're working to reform antiquated voter registration laws that disproportionately disenfranchise Black and immigrant voters. We're working to reprecing Boston. You know, I just wanted to bring it a little bit more closer. Re reprecing Boston so that Black and immigrant workers don't have to wait in line for hours to vote while their white neighbors wait only minutes. We're working to ensure that Black and immigrant voters have equal access to early voting and vote by mail resources. So let's get a little bit more into that. You know, uh, since the nation's inception, there has been a tension between having the right to vote and being able to exercise that right. Uh, please share with us some of the barriers and exclusions, both historical and contemporary that have prevented or dissuaded people from exercising their right to vote and, and share your thoughts on the, on the impact. Uh, Rasan? Uh, there, there's so many, where do we begin? I, I think, uh, some of the more significant efforts. I mean, you know, we can look historically at uh, poll taxes that were created to prevent uh, black people from voting or the grandfather clause, meaning someone uh, was not eligible to vote unless their grandfather uh, was able to vote. And when you're coming out of slavery, it's clear for the first, second, and then sometimes third generations, uh, your grandfather was not going to be uh, able to vote. And so those are significant uh, roadblocks or barriers that stood in the way of people uh, obtaining the franchise. The, the rise of Black codes in the post-Reconstruction era, again, the, the criminalization of, of Black people, uh, when we start to see some of these felony uh, disenfranchisement laws where uh, they're criminalizing Black people and so we can further disenfranchise them uh, by taking uh, the vote away from people. Even when we kind of fast forward for the, the sake of time and we look at the significance of uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, substantial improvements that are made uh, at the, as a response to uh, the overwhelming efforts uh, that people made. You know, I think of Freedom Summer and the people that had risked their life and limb uh, to go down to the South to make sure that people were registered to vote. But little by little, there were consistently efforts to detract from the franchise. I mean, the Voting Rights Act was an authorized initially for five years. It kept getting renewed every five years. And then after a point, because of the testimony that was received uh, before Congress about the acts of disenfranchisement and voter suppression, they began to authorize it for 20 and 25 years. Um, and even the last time uh, that it was uh, reauthorized, uh, some of the, the tales of the tape as far as what had been happening as um, from people being uh, denied the opportunity to, to vote, closure of polling locations, um, you know, uh, changing uh, the requirements to vote in certain uh, locations, ch challenges uh, through redistricting, drawing districts in certain ways. There are so many ways that uh, there has been an effort uh, to suppress and deny uh, the vote. And so one of the last things 
that I, I, I want to talk about, because I know Cheryl can get into a lot more of some of the contemporary uh, voter suppression efforts that we are seeing currently, uh, is there is a, 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 a UMass Boston professor, uh, Aaron O'Brien, who did a study several years ago that looked at the correlation between the rise in voter suppression laws being placed on the books uh, in the immediate aftermath uh, of the Obama uh, election. And what was consistent in all of these places uh, was that it was a, uh, a Republican legislature uh, through the state, that there had been a significant increase uh, in voter turnout in the black community that overwhelmingly voted uh, for o Obama. And I think those are uh, significant because that's where we see the voter ID laws and the closing of polling locations and uh, different requirements and, and constraints that are put uh, on voting that continue to happen uh, to this day. So there's uh, so much to go through, uh, but I think those are some of the things that we should keep in mind when we're thinking about voter suppression. So let's have Cheryl weigh in and then you, Martha, please. Cheryl? Right, so I'm just gonna pick up like from when the 14th and 15th amendment was ratified, they were truly enforceable measures because the period of reconstruction was thriving, right? And until 1877, um, black men voted in unprecedented fashion. But unfortunately the compromise of 1877 brought an end to this emancipation. Almost immediately state legislators across the South implemented measures that made it virtually impossible for black men and soon after women to vote. And for nearly 100 years, Southern states used the law to suppress the black vote. Poll taxes, literacy tests, and the grandfather clause were some of the legal mechanisms employed. Outright intimidation was also used with the KKK intimidating countless potential black voters through fear mongering and brute force. But then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 outlawed many of these mechanisms and made new ones more difficult to implement. However, the Supreme Court case Shelby County versus Holder in 2013 dramatically weakened that enforceability of the VRA. And since Congress has not remedied this by reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, the law has essentially been hollowed out. Since then, states have wasted no time in implementing new laws that disproportionately disenfranchise Black and immigrant workers. And I'll just give two quick recent examples. And one of the most recent examples, the governor of Texas mandated that each county may only have one mail ballot drop box in Harris County, which is the home to Houston and incredibly diverse. It has 5 million people. And then another case is in Georgia, we recently saw black voters literally waiting 10 hours to vote early. Officials claim that this is due specifically to higher turnout. But in a state like Georgia, with a long, sad history of voter suppression and intimidation, we know that this is not due to the, more, the higher turnout. Okay, Martha, that tension between uh, having the right to vote and being able to exercise the right to vote. Um, I think what I'm gonna do if I could, Karen, is take us back, way back in time um, to underscore the point um, that the story of American voting rights is dominated by the story of voter suppression rather than the myth that is oftentimes served up to us, one that suggests somehow we are an ever expanding and more inclusive democracy. There are black Americans who vote at the end of the 18th century and too many of them will lose the vote in the earliest years of the 19th century. When for example, in my home state of Maryland, the word white will be added to the state constitution as a qualifier um, if one is to exercise voting rights. And so really from the earliest years of this country, um, voter suppression is the order of the day. In states like New York and Pennsylvania where black men voted in the early 19th century and were even acknowledged as citizens, um, property qualifications were imposed. And in the state of Pennsylvania, their right to vote was revoked altogether in the 1830s. Um, if we come forward to the important period that we've all touched on after the Civil War and during early Reconstruction, it's important to remember um, that the ways in which the 14th Amendment 
um, intersects with Chinese exclusion acts mean that too many Chinese immigrants have no avenue to naturalization or citizenship at the end of the 19th century, remain non-citizens, and hence ineligible to vote in nearly every state in the US. Um, we could tell this story moving all the way, of course, until our own time. And while we speak an important um, myth um, in this country about the, uh, the nexus between citizenship and the right to vote. There is in fact no legal nexus between citizenship and the right to vote in this country. And many of us remain disenfranchised by state laws that avoid prohibited terms like race, uh, like gender, like age, um, but still manage as my colleagues have already um, touched upon, still manage to keep so many of us from the polls by other terms. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, if I have this statistic uh, uh, incorrect, but uh, I read somewhere recently that uh, when the country was founded, when the constitution was signed, that only 6% of the people who lived in the United States at the time were actually legally eligible to vote because you had to be uh, a white male landowner. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see you both nodding. On the, on the number, uh, Karen, but the principle holds without a, a doubt, right, that um, at the inception. Um, but in fact, um, you know, um, Black Americans and even women in a state like New Jersey slip through the cracks in those early years and um, do manage to get to the polls. Um, it will take time for state lawmakers to, um, if you will, plug those loopholes and keep both women and Black Americans um, from the polls altogether. Hmm. We have a, a comment from the chat. Tyson wonders, how can we in more progressive states like Massachusetts aid and assist states where voter suppression is heavy like Georgia? Cheryl Clyburn Crawford uh, referenced uh, Georgia in her comments. Um, Cheryl? Well, you know, um, you can do, especially now that everything's virtual, right, due to COVID, you can absolutely join in phone banks from around the country um, and supporting them in helping to turn out the vote or just helping. Up until recently, we were talking to people about um, making sure that they were registered to vote. Tomorrow's the last day to register to vote here in Massachusetts. But, you know, and, and different states have different times, but just, you know, making sure that you support these efforts, resources, they could always use resources, right? And they could use people to help make phone calls. Okay, so continuing on that theme from the vantage point of, of all of the work that the three of you do, what, what are or have been some uh, creative or particularly effective strategies and efforts to increase voter registration and turnout um, particularly among populations where voter turnout was previously denied or, or historically low? Um, I can jump in um, and offer up um, uh, an example um, from uh, my work on Vanguard where um, Black women uh, who um, some might have thought would have won the vote, if you will, with ratification of the 19th Amendment are under no illusions. Um, but that the Jim Crow strictures, the violence and intimidation that have kept their husbands and fathers from the polls um, are now going to keep black women from the polls. And there is organizing work to do on the ground in every election cycle in those years. Black women run suffrage schools. They teach one another how to pay a poll tax, how to pass a literacy test. They study the constitution together so that when they are quizzed um, at the registrar's desk, um, they can explain a complex provision like the electoral college. Um, I think there's no substitute in this country for the ground game of politics, um, which means that we have to be in the trenches in every cycle. And at the same time, the women I write about are very committed to keeping the bar high. Um, and that, um, so I, if I could piggyback on, if Cheryl wouldn't mind on her remarks about that, um, you know, um, 
I don't know enough about Massachusetts, but in my home state where we pride ourselves on um, having very few barriers um, when it comes to exercising voting rights, we do not guarantee to Marylanders the right to vote at all. There is no promise in our constitution. There is no burden on the state to ensure that we have ballots, that we get to cast them and that they are counted. The burden in so many, in all our states, I think still remains on citizens. And uh, if you wanna hold the bar high, ask your state lawmakers to promulgate a constitutional amendment that guarantees to everyone in Massachusetts the right to vote, citizen or not, um, that's where I think the high bar is. Mm. Maria comments in the chat that she was very surprised to learn that um, our neighbor, our state neighbor, Rhode Island, requires a government issue ID to vote. And then we have another uh, comment in our chat. Someone would like you to speak to the forces behind Shelby County versus Holder in 2013 and what's happening now to reestablish the full and actionable intent of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Rasan, would you like to take that one? Sure. I, I think the, the forces uh, behind the Shelby County decision without uh, being partisan are um, the, the folks who would like to maintain uh, the status quo uh, of American history. And I, I think specifically, you know, so there, there's, there's two issues, I think, with the Shelby County decision in regards to that question, which is, you know, kind of what is the legal or procedural approach um, that led to that case, but then also what is the uh, societal and political um, approach and issue. And so the, the, the easier one, the societal political uh, approach is uh, a desire to, to maintain uh, power. There are, there are many in this country who believe that this is a white Christian nation that it was created as such and that it should be maintained uh, as such. And to the extent that there are other people uh, who have more progressive values that are more people of color, that there are more people of various religious backgrounds and beliefs that come in to this country and shape and transform uh, the landscape of who this country is, that is a threat uh, to the promise of what this country for some believe it is supposed to be. That sense of entitlement is being challenged. The, the, you know, the underlying uh, legal issue without um, parsing it too deeply is th this notion uh, of whether or not the, the, the test that is used um, to determine which states are covered by the pre-clearance formula, formula in section three, which basically means that any time one of these jurisdictions uh, would make a change to voting rights, uh, they would have to get seek pre-clearance uh, from the Department of Justice to make that change, whether it's moving uh, polling locations or uh, changing ID requirements. And that was determined by a formula that was created in the 60s when it looked at voter registration rates and, and uh, voter turnout rates, uh, particularly looking at the number of Black people who were registered in a particular state and seeing that those numbers were far out of alignment. And so that's how states came into uh, uh, preclearance coverage. Uh, and so the, the Supreme Court and Chief Justice uh, Roberts drew out Massachusetts in particular and say, how can Mississippi still be covered uh, by this formula when Massachusetts has lower registration rates, uh, particularly among people of color in Mississippi? Um, and, and, and so therefore, uh, Section 5 gets kind of eliminated and then the preclearance requirement no matter means anything. Um, and so as far as what's being done, there's the John Lewis Voting Rights Act that is before uh, Congress to, to be enacted, but you've, we've all seen the kind of political uh, turmoil that exists. And so there's not really going to be an opportunity uh, in this session, I don't believe, to, to see that come to fruition. We'll see what 2021 and 2022 uh, hold uh, uh, for us. And so as far as, as Rhode Island, it's, it's not surprising uh, that there are a lot of states that have state uh, ID requirements. Massachusetts, we're fortunate that there's um, you know, an identification requirement, but it doesn't need to be necessarily a photo um, ID. And so these are some of the fights that we are continuing uh, to fight uh, throughout the country. Um, Rasan, you said earlier that a lot of this, um, these, these things, it's cyclical. Um, and back on this point of strategies and efforts to increase voter registration and turnout, how do uh, disenfranchised people break the cycle 
so that the shift in power allows more people to participate in the voting process. How does that cycle uh, get permanently broken or shifted? Yeah, I, I think you know that 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 question is a, a bit challenging for me only because there's a part of me that says like that's not our responsibility to do that, right? The rules of the laws of oppression uh, and and, uh, and structural racism and white supremacy, like that's not something that we created, uh, but yet we're left with the burden of trying to dismantle it and address it. That said. Uh, because we want to live freely in this country, because we want to have access and power and access to power and representation, we are implored to fight against it. And I, I want to go back to a point Dr. Jones made, uh, uh, particularly thinking about um, uh, women and Black women in particular, and the uh, the, the role of kind of the, the Black women's club uh, movement uh, at, at, the, at the time, at the turn of the century, like these sisters were the ones that were making sure that Black men were voting, that they were getting out to the polls. They would show up with guns to make sure that the men could get to the polls uh, and vote and that they had the information about what was at stake uh, on the ballot, that they had the money to make sure that the poll taxes um, were paid. And that transcends when you look at some of the things that are being done, some of the innovative things. It's just like stroll to the poll. You see some of the sisters in the fraternities, the sorority, excuse me, the sororities of the Divine Nine turning out to get people to the polls. And that's part of what their platforms uh, have been. When I say the Divine Nine, I'm talking about some of the Black uh, Panhellenic Greek letter uh, uh, organizations. Um, you know, and, and anything that increases access and opportunity to polling, Massachusetts, to, the, to the polls. Massachusetts saw a tremendous increase in voter turnout in, in this primary that just happened in 20, uh, uh, back in September because we expanded early voting, because we allowed no, uh, no excuse absentee voting. Uh, we shortened the registration deadline and the voting numbers went up to like 1.7 million, which blew away the previous record for, for primary ballots cast in a primary. So by expanding access, uh, to the poll and, re and eliminating and removing barriers. And, and ultimately, if folks would just follow Black women, we'd be in far better condition than we are now. Amen. Amen yeah. to that. <laughs> but um, it also requires um, a change in attitude in terms of making people understand why they need to participate in the voting process, right? Because you know, you have to vote in the midterm elections because many of these voter ID laws are, are constructed at the state level. So that means you need to impact the, your, your local state legislatures, um, uh, right? So it's, it's, there's so many different layers to this. It's not just coming out for the presidential election every once every four years. Oh, right. absolutely. Oh. Cheryl? Uh, that, that all politics is local. This is on, um, that's the level that most impacts your daily life. But I wanted to pick up on, you know, one of the few benefits we see, we are seeing this year born out of all of this unrest that we've experienced is that people of all backgrounds want to get involved. You know, I think about Stacey Abrams, you know, I keep going back to Georgia and maybe because my family's down there and thinking about Stacey Abrams because they flat out stole that election. Um, but her fair fight encourages voter participation in elections and educate voters about elections and their voting rights. You know, uh, Fair Fight brings awareness to the public on election reform advocates for election reforms at all levels and engages other voter education programs and communications. I'm, I'm really um, geeked about that program because she really, she did not get out of the fight. Like she said, I, what did she say? I am not, um, what do you call Conceding. it? Thank you. She said, I'm not conceding this election. Mm -hmm. And then she went to work. And then I think about um, our young people who are typically um, disenfranchised. And I think about organizations like Create the Vote, um, a nonpartisan grassroots campaign with a focus on increasing civic engagement and strengthening democracy. You know, um, Bass Vote is a part of their steering committee. Uh, and they, we've hosted tons of webinars and workshops and created graphics and reduced, you know, resources and tools to educate and activate the creative community um, around civic engagement. We're talking about groups that may not get involved as often, such as celebrities and athletes. I'm really excited about them using their, uh, embracing their voice and encouraging folks to register and vote. Uh, we partnered this year with 
organization, the Boston Celtics, a little organization called the Boston Celtics, right? Um, to get out the vote, this election, producing materials, right? Like, so everybody has a role in, in getting out the vote. Everybody, no matter what platform you're on or where you stand in, you can do something to help get out the vote and include these organizations and groups that don't typically lend their voice to this, this work. Hmm. Martha, how, but how do we get, uh, get our citizenry to want to participate in the voting process? Sometimes only 50% of our citizens actually participate. You know, uh, when uh, Nelson Mandela was was uh, uh, elected, 95% of people participated in the election that year. And, you know, we can sometimes barely hit 50%. Um, well, it's not a uniquely U.S. problem. You do uh -huh. want more the ways in which um, when we look across the globe, um, this nation stands out for um, low voter turnout, um, decreasing voter turnout and more. Um, and yet I'm gonna borrow a, a, a page if I could from Rashawn because I think that um, what we know about black women in this country is that um, they indeed do not only register, um, but turn out at the polls in numbers that are disproportionate um, to Americans across the board. Um, so it is another moment, I think, in part to take a page from Black women, to follow Black women, believe Black women. Um, you know, folks have asked me in this season, how can we get Black women to the polls? And I said, I think that you've got the question sort of twisted. Exactly. Right? <laughs> right? To keep them away from the polls, right? <laughs> Understanding what Black women are doing. And part of the, the answer to that is, is what Rashawn alluded to, right? That Black women are still working, you know, to an important degree through those old networks, right, that, that go back to the Civil War, right, go back to that era when Black women um, knit together their benevolent associations across the country to provide relief um, and support for Black soldiers um, and refugees during the Civil War. Um, those give us the club movement, Black women suffragists, um, and on into the modern civil rights era and beyond. Um, and so um, it is, I think I couldn't agree more with Cheryl about the ways in which um, all politics is local. And at the same time, what black women have learned to do is to knit together, right? That um, intensity, that commitment, that relevance that is local um, and um, turn it into a, a, a national, um, force. And this is part of what I see. When I see 120 plus Black women running for Congress in 2020, a record shattering number of Black women, I say we're onto something um, and watch, right, the way in which those candidates can help ignite an electorate. You know, that's what Shirley Chisholm did in 1972. Shirley Chisholm um, didn't I don't think believe she was going to be the Democratic nominee for president in 1972. But what she knew was that her candidacy would ignite millions of Black Americans who had only been recently enfranchised um, by way of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And so I think we have to attend to those dynamics and, and learn and promote frankly, our history, our political culture, and more um, as a model, um, something to build on, um, rather than to think in this country, we have to start from scratch. Cheryl, you have any other thoughts on that? I, I don't think I really have a lot more to add to that. Thank you. Okay. So um, Martha, let's go back a little bit in, in history, if we will, Dr. Jones. Um, in his final speech, President Lincoln expressed his belief that black men who had served as soldiers for the Union cause during the Civil War should be entitled to the right to vote. And this is precisely what the men of the Mass 54th reasoned and were thinking about as they marched out of Boston in service to the country on this date that we're talking about, May 28th, 1863. Um, if we could, Martha, Dr. Jones, 
what do you think, what, what more do you think the men of the 54th were thinking on that day in May? And what was the um, context and, and what was happening in society during that time of 1863? Sure. Um, so here we are um, still um, with some profound open questions. Um, what is the fate of slavery in this country? And even as I think in May of 1863, Black Americans certainly could see slavery's abolition on the horizon, though it would be a struggle to get there, um, the open question then of what is freedom, um, which is to say um, that there is no presumption in this moment that with freedom comes citizenship. Um, there's certainly no presumption that with freedom come political rights, including the right to vote. Um, so I see these men as um, in part um, pressing forward on a set of profound questions that will certainly consume the nation for years to come after 1863. And we might say, continue to consume the nation even today. What is freedom? What is citizenship? And more. Now, I'll add one more thing. Um, and I, this is a generous, but it's a sincere read that I think these are men who have on their minds um, their families and their communities, including the women, those that have raised them up, um, those who have partnered with them, their daughters and more. And part of what we know from the archives of this moment is that indeed um, the mothers and the sisters of these men are as engaged with those questions as are the men who are um, armed in uniform and participating in um, the conflict on the front lines. And when we look at the um, papers, for example, of, of Abraham Lincoln, we find the letters that come from black women um, who tell us um, how concerned they are, that they have opinions about these scenes and about these men, and they hold the president, um, his feet to the fire on ensuring that these men have what they need um, in terms of material goods, but in terms of dignity, um, so this is really, for me, a portrait of a discrete group of men that really stands in for a historical set of questions um, and also for an entire community um, that is, um, is consumed um, by those questions in these years and beyond. Cheryl, as you look at this uh, picture, this, what do you think was on the minds of those men as they were marching out of Boston? in May of 1863? Well, <clears throat> what I'm thinking about is what they would be saying to us right now, as, mm -hmm. right, as we're watching them. They're like saying, keep fighting for change, right? Keep fighting for freedom. Don't be afraid to be the first. Don't be, don't be afraid to be bold in your, in your actions, right? Um, we are, we are not free. We are not free as evidenced by what we're dealing with today in America. Keep fighting and most importantly, vote. We need everyone to vote. Vote. What do you think, Rasan? What do you think would be on their minds? Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know exactly, uh, but I know what I would appreciate uh, hearing from them, uh, you know, I think these men uh, would have been alive uh, during Frederick Douglass's speech that he delivered 11 years before what to the slave is the 4th of July, where uh, in his concluding remarks, uh, he stated as commentary on the ignorance that justified uh, slavery uh, that was giving uh, way to inevitability. Uh, Douglas said, intelligence is penetrating the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea as well as on the earth. Wind, stream, and lightning are its chartered agents. And I would appreciate uh, hearing these men say or knowing that they were thinking uh, that we depart to offer our lives in battle for the moral conscience of the nation. Our, our blood will nurture the soil that future generations will reap bountiful harvests from. 
but it will not be without labor, toil, and sacrifice. The cultivation of a heightened social enlightenment will not come to fruition on its own, but rather through a dogged determination to be the wind stream enlightening. And so among the fruit of their sacrifices are the entitlements to the bounty and of rights that this nation uh, provides. And so I live into that and I believe that that's what could be uh, said was on their minds. Carl in the chat reminds us that Sergeant Carney said, quote, I could best serve my God by serving my country and my oppressed brothers. The sequel is short, I enlisted for war. Hmm, very powerful, very powerful quote. I wanna pick up something else uh, that was earlier in the chat and, and Cheryl said this, you know, um, she would, uh, she wonders what they would be talking to us about today. Uh, Jerry um, thanks the group today for addressing the proposed John Lewis, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And she has wondered perhaps if um, all the corporations and sports franchises who are not promoting voting will turn their attention uh, after the election to help pass this important le legislation. I guess the point kind of is use uh, some uh, armies that have not yet been activated for the cause. Um, maybe look to other corners for support. Uh, Cheryl? Absolutely. Um, we have a, there are a lot of people that are not involved in civic engagement. And yes, and they have big platforms which they could use. So we are encouraging and, and starting to increase participation. You know, since George Floyd's death and everybody wants to be involved in being on the right side of being black, right? Racial equity and equality. And now is the time for us to just really tap into those resources and mm -hmm. talk to them about getting involved. How do they use their platform? Um, many of them, artists, as I touched upon it earlier, artists and athletes and uh, actors and actresses, right? They have huge platforms. They absolutely could change and could reach other markets that we have not reached yet. So yes, we're encouraging that. I had a chance um, in New York uh, maybe four years ago to visit an exhibit at the New York Historical Society. Um, and it was about the role that the Supreme Court played in um, uh, voter suppression. Um, and at the end of that exhibit, it was beautifully laid out. Um, I was in tears because I see that this is something that could happen again today. Um, the exhibit at the New York Historical Society was, was showing how the Supreme Court, which is supposed to be the law of the land, um, was not in accordance with what I would think my rights as an African-American should be uh, in terms of giving me the right to vote as a full citizen of this country. That the Supreme Court was, was siding with those essentially that wanted to disenfranchise me and those that look like me. And that's a very, for me, a very scary proposition that that could occur again, I say with a question mark at the end of my sentence. Rasan? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a question mark. I, I, I see that as a declarative statement when I look at the composition uh, of the current Supreme Court and the nomination that will likely be uh, voted and confirmed, you know, these are lifetime appointments. And so we're looking at a generation's worth of undoing some of the progressive uh, decisions that came out of uh, the court over the last several uh, decades. But I mean, we, we can't look to the courts to save us. It is the role of civil society organizations and people in the streets uh, to demand better, to um, push uh, for better representation. And that's why uh, voting is so important. I mean, Plessy versus Ferguson, <laughs> uh, which determines separate but equal as the law of the land is a Supreme Court 
uh, decision. And so, you know, I'm reminded of Audre Lorde who said, you know, the master's tools will never enable us to dismantle the master's house. It may give us a benefit uh, so that we can have an advantage. And so like, we'll find our spots. Uh, but it's really about uh, mobilization of the of the people and leaning into the electoral process uh, to to really change it. And I think that's um, to an earlier question about encouraging turnout and engagement. I think about uh, the 2018 race uh, that we had and here in Boston, and we saw unprecedented numbers of people turning out to the polls. And when you think about who was on the ballot where we had Ayanna Presley, uh, who was on the ballot. We had Rachel Rollins, uh, who was on the ballot. And we had Liz uh, Miranda and Nika Elugardu and, you know, and all of these black women. And so if, if people believe that there is someone that uh, uh, is inspiring to them, that will actually speak to uh, their issues, they will be uh, engaged. And so, yes, it is important to vote and take these civic responsibilities importantly, uh, but we also have to have representation that encourages and inspires uh, people uh, to come out. Martha, do you have any uh, historical perspective you want to add on this on this point? You know, um, it's a tough question, but the way I would illuminate in part where we are is by taking us back to um, the language of the 15th Amendment, the language of the uh, 19th Amendment, for example, both of which put breaks on what states may not do, right? May not use race, um, may not use sex as a criteria when it comes to casting a ballot, but there's no guarantee um, of the vote in those amendments at all. Um, and so for me, we work in a, um, and we advocate in a, um, in a deeply flawed um, structure um, a constitution that is at best ambivalent about our voting rights and a constitution to which we cannot turn um, when we are denied the vote, except on very narrow um, and in this Supreme Court's view express um, sorts of limitations. Um, so again, um, I, I, you know, the women I write about insist on holding the bar up high um, and um, doing the groundwork, getting in the trenches, but at the same ho time holding the bar high. And until um, we have a shift in our, the fundamentals of our constitutional regimes, um, we are going to be fighting these battles at every turn in every generation, um, because whether it is black Americans or it is Chinese immigrants or it is Muslim Americans go down the list, there will be those folks in this country who are the despised um, and for whom um, this constitution will not work. Um, and so I'm one, um, as I guess I've already tipped my hand who thinks that um, part of the work or at least part of the aspiration for the work is um, for the first time in this country, um, setting in place a constitutional regime that guarantees to citizens the right to vote. Um, and um, that to me would be um, a baseline for um, the possibility that we might rethink this um, always present, always resurgent fact of voter suppression um, in our history. A mm. um, couple of comments in the chat. Emma wonders, are there monuments or memorials to the 14th Amendment, African-American suffrage? She says she can't think of any, um, though she can think of some that commemorate the 19th Amendment women's suffrage, which often didn't include Black women in practice. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jones? Nodding. It's a great. It, it's a great observation. Um, I mean, I'm one who will say, um, having spent a lot of this year um, in events that have commemorated 100 years um, since ratification of the 19th Amendment, there have been too few events that have um, honored and acknowledged and honored um, that we are also um, 150 years um, from ratification of the 15th Amendment. 
um, that that imbalance is um, hardly lost on me. Um, and at the same time, you know, the monuments to suffragists that have um, been uh, installed and unveiled in this anniversary year of the 19th Amendment have undergone um, a good and important level of scrutiny um, as they have um, gone through various public review processes. Um, and um, the one I know best is in New York City, um, where originally there was a monument, pro monument proposed that would have included two figures, um, Elizabeth, Katie Stanton, and Susan B. Anthony, um, as an homage to the early uh, suffragists. Um, and there was a good dust up um, through op-ed pages and uh, public hearings and more that led to the addition of um, Sojourner Truth, another courageous um, radical uh, New Yorker of the 19th century who now sits or yeah, sits in her case um, on that pedestal with um, Anthony and Stanton in New York Central Park. Um, people ask me whether I think that's enough. That's probably a conversation for another day. It might not be, um, but it's to say that um, the in this uh, anniversary year, um, those who have proposed monuments to women and to women's votes have found themselves um, I think importantly challenged by a great deal that we've learned through the debates around Confederate monuments, right? That monuments are political, um, that they contain meanings and significance, both um, obvious and, um, and unspoken, um, and that they have a long life. And so they need to be thought through not only for what they stand for in the year in which they are unveiled, but what they stand for um, for many, many, many years to come. Um, that's a high bar, I'll say, and I'm very glad to be a historian who writes books and articles and doesn't design monuments at all, because I think that's a, that's a really tall order. Um, but these are important questions because once again, we are creating a legacy, right, for our daughters and our granddaughters, and it better be one that speaks to all of them and not only some of them. I believe that Sojourner Truth should have her due. Um, I have seen some pushback to the monument that you are referencing because the suggestion was that she would not have been seated across from Katie Stanton, that it's uh, historically inaccurate and that people who see that monument today might not understand uh, the real history that the women's suffrage movement did not accept um, or acknowledge women like Sojourner Truth. You are, you are, you are spot on. And, and this is why you're not in the monument making <laughs> either, if I put it that way, Karen, uh, because these are, these are very difficult choices. But if we look across the country, there's some really interesting um, examples. You know, the state of Tennessee is um, unveiled this year, it's third monument to women's suffragists. And each time they do it, um, they get it better, if I could say that for, for, for the, to the folks of Tennessee, they become more diverse, more inclusive, um, more reflective of the fullness of the history. Um, but it is, a, it is a tough thing to do. You know, in the Capitol Rotunda, Mary McLeod Bethune, the great suffragist educator and um, politician is gonna replace a Confederate uh, officer who had long represented the state of Florida in that space. Um, so there is, I think, a, a great deal to be lauded about some of these changes, um, but they are, um, they suffer from the, the limitations of the genre. And this is, again, why I write books and I don't design mine. <laughs> I understand completely. Haroon uh, from the uh, comment section says, uh, these, these men, excuse me, were inspired and motivated with courage by the at first to oh, 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 oh. at first to defy and die for freedom and equal rights in America by a black man just like them his name was Crispus Attucks a revolutionary war patriot mhm mm Megan Woods comments why have black women's efforts been overshadowed uh white supremacy <laughs> uh, like i think that's just kind of the the nature of this 
country is to deny and uh, and erasure. Um, you know, I, I think white dominant culture is such that it looks to um, uh, lionize its idols and heroes and um, not consider, you know, like, okay, fine. <laughs> if, we, if we don't want to attribute malice to people in positions of, uh, of, of power, those who are, you know, uh, writing history, um, then we can say, take the path of least resistant and say that there are biases that people have. Uh, I'm not inclined to not to uh, to not attribute malice. Um, you know, there's a, a, a proverb, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's essentially uh, until the the um, you know as long yeah I'm, yeah I'm butchering it now, but in, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the the hunter will always be the victor, mm -hmm. or something like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, my apologies to those who know the proverb. <laughs> Well, we get we get the drift. Uh, another comment in the in the um, chat refers back to something that you said earlier, uh, Dr. Jones. Richard says the lack of guarantee in the Constitution is tenuous and keeps the door open for white supremacy to be reinforced. It opens the door to voter suppression, right? It, it precisely the kind of voter suppression um, that. The, the folks um, that I'm sharing, uh, we're sharing this conversation with are, are on the front lines of padding, right? That um, there is, there is, um, there are prohibitions in the constitution and otherwise the door is wide open. The Voting Rights Act did some of that work for us, but post 2013, um, it is very difficult as I'm understanding it, right? To um, to challenge these kinds of strictures. And there is not an, a direct or um, a easy resort to the constitution. Maybe there should be. Kelly asks, are there any examples of black and white women being allies in this work? Open allies, openly public allies. I'll jump in and say, sure, historically um, um, important alliances, um, for example, in the 1830s in the anti-slavery movement, um, in the years after 1920 um, in the movement for interracial cooperation. Um, uh, Ida Wells, um, the great journalist, anti-lynching uh, advocate and suffragist, um, works importantly with white suffragists in the city of Chicago and the state of Illinois um, in the earliest years of women's votes there. Um, we do have examples of that. Uh, my my um, sort of broad, but I think useful analysis to say is hardest to do that on a national scale um, it, historically, that um, we have important examples of women's alliances across the color line um, in politics and church and, and more um, uh, locally and even on the state level. But it has been a hard part of our history to recognize that in national contests like the campaign for women's voting rights and women's suffrage in the early 20th century, um, that was a movement that did not resist the temptation ultimately to trade in white supremacy, to trade in racism, to accommodate it in order to get to goal. Black women were expendable, white women won a 19th amendment. Um, that is, um, that is a, a history that still, I think, plagues us on the national level in politics even today. Carl reminds us that there is a monument to Sojourner Truth in Florence Mass near Smith College. I'm gonna go back to a uh, comment in the chat. Nathan says the right to vote is certainly important, but with redlining still occurring, unfortunately, not all votes are treated equally. He is curious about the thoughts of the panel on the electoral uh, college and how that plays into racial equality of voting. Our esteemed panel, Rasan. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think um, certainly there are significant problems with uh, the way that the Electoral uh, College came into being, um, the apportioning of um, uh, 
uh, votes. I, I think there are significant issues with um, redistricting and how uh, districts are, are drawn and efforts at um, uh, diminishing uh, voter power uh, are, is something that was certainly and continues to be exacerbated um, uh, by the history of, of redlining. I think, you know, we see uh, redlining now through some of the mortgage foreclosure crisis and the subprime um, loans that were deployed to certain um, uh, communities. Um, but the, the, the broader conversation around the kind of elimination of the electoral college uh, is one that has captured a lot of attention uh, particularly when you think about the incidents where the uh, person who has won the presidency did not win uh, the popular vote. And when you think about uh, some of the roots of the Electoral College and how it's tied to slavery to ensure um, that uh, there was different representation because of the population of enslaved uh, Africans in this country, uh, these relics of a past era uh, show up in very problematic ways mm -hmm. um, today. And so I think the more information that people have about it and the more conversation uh, there is, there's certainly a movement uh, for a national popular vote. Uh, different states are enacting um, uh, state level legislation to say that if there ever becomes a national popular vote, we as a state agree to participate. So uh, I think Massachusetts has moved in that direction and uh, hopefully it, it picks up steam. Hmm. And I, I, I just want to say, you know, we keep dancing around this thing, this thing called the Constitution, something that we know that was truly not written for us, right? White men with property, and at that time we were the property. Um, and then we talk about young people and engaging young people, and they keep talking about we need to dismantle this system, right? Of course, I think that that's a conversation. We think about new tools and ways that we can vote and be more inclusive. You know, um, we know people participate in elections at a higher rate when there's competitive elections. So, what are we really doing to increase? competitive elections, right? Like there's things like what's on our ballot here in Massachusetts this year, ranked choice voting, um, which offers up another system, another way for us to be more inclusive and to diversify the pool. I know here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, they've been voting that way um, um, for 20 years plus, and it's Cambridge City Council is the most diverse, one of the most diverse in the country. And so we keep looking at these different systems, which I think is a conversation that we need to have on November 4th. Don't get it twisted. Not right now. December 4th. <laughs> we need to have these conversations so that we can really talk about what are some of the other structures that we can put in place to make sure or to just, you know, and bring in and bring in our young voices and help them, you know, really unpack this, what system are we operating under? Because the constitution is not, and has really never worked for us. Mm. Okay. All right, another comment. Sean uh, says, Rasan Hall mentioned that black women provided protection to black men voters. What role did Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and other Boston area suffragists play in this? Anyone want to talk about Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin? I, I don't know her, but I need to She's go find uh, out. Happy to. <laughs> yes, back. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, um, uh, among other things, is one of the founders of what becomes the National Association of Colored Women um, in the middle of the 1890s. It grows into what is the largest political organization of Black women um, by the eve of the First World War. Some 300,000 plus Black women across the country organized, mobilized. Um, it is the heart of Black women's um, suffrage um, advocacy. Um, it is the organization that leads Black women um, out of the disappointments of the 19th Amendment and into a new movement for voting rights. Um, oftentimes credited she is with being the wife of a judge, um, but as far back as 1863, she is an organizer um, out of Boston raising money 
collecting goods and providing relief and support for the young men of the Massachusetts 54th, um, but also um, formerly enslaved refugees um, and much more. Um, so she is um, absolutely essential to this conversation and I'm so glad someone uh, called on us to remember her. She's, I'm uh, so glad too. <laughs> at the at the heart of a uh, very uh, fervent community of Black people on Beacon Hill during that time frame, and I believe that there are lots of artifacts uh, from Miss uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin housed at the Boston Athenaeum for those that want to do some more research on uh, her and her life and what she meant to the. Uh, abolition movement. I'm going to ask uh, each of you to give us one closing thought. Um, if monuments could talk, what do you think the figures in this monument would say to us today about the role that each of us plays in advancing the ideals of the perilous march to freedom? Rasan, let's begin with you. Um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to my comment earlier about what I think was on the mind uh, of these soldiers as they were uh, departing. And, you know, this, this notion that their sacrifice uh, is, is going to provide the sustenance uh, for the, the growth of, of who this country, who this nation is truly called to be in the most ideal interpretation of our founding documents uh, because they have been poorly and uh, ineffectively executed. Um, so, but with that in mind, it is the, the, the legacy of, of their sacrifice, the sacrifice of their mothers and wives and sisters and aunts and children and family that they are connected to through the generations uh, that have been the foundation of the, the kind of the, the moral consciousness uh, of this country. And so given that uh, it is the, the duty because of our ancestors, um, whether direct blood tie ancestors or cultural ancestors uh, that we must continue uh, to struggle, to labor and toil uh, to push this nation to be uh, who it is prophesied to be, who it is uh, idealized to be. And, and I think when we continue to do that, when we continue to fight and when we continue uh, to, to struggle, that we will begin to see the fruits of that labor, if even not for our generation, for um, the, the next generation and the generations to come. Carol, your thoughts? What do you think the figures in this monument are saying to us all today about the perilous march to freedom and how we need to step up and help advance that march? Absolutely, activism. We must continue to be active and we must, be, we must continue to be participants in this democracy. We must not be afraid to be participants in this democracy. And my message is simple, vote. Voting can is one tactic in a much larger strategy. And if we vote, we can make change. We have seen changes made with voting. We must continue until we can figure out this system that we're functioning in. We must continue to vote and bring people in that represent our issues and our values. Vote, it's simple vote. Martha Jones, Dr. Jones, what role does each of us have to play in advancing the ideals of the perilous march to freedom? I'm going to share with you a question that was posed to be my, my friend, Dr. Noel Trent at the National Civil Rights Museum. It was a simple one, but it was profound. Um, what sort of ancestor will you be? which is a reminder to us that we are here, yes, um, for ourselves and for our own time, um, but we will be um, judged by our daughters and our granddaughters who will ask us, where were you in 2020 that fall? What did you do um, in the fall of 2020 in the face of such a consequential uh, political contest? Um, and I am one um, who would like to be remembered, perhaps hardly as courageous, as valiant, 
um, as the men of the Massachusetts 54th, but I'd like to think that my granddaughter will look back and um, take um, lesson and take inspiration um, from the work that I did here in this critical moment. Um, and I hope we all take that long view uh, of, of where our choices in this critical moment um, will be judged uh, down the road. So much to talk about in this conversation. I, I wish we had more time. Um, we have to wrap things up. We cannot thank you enough, Cheryl Clyburn Crawford, Rasan Hall, Martha Jones, for engaging us in this very amazing conversation. And we wanna thank the audience too for participating in tonight's community conversation. Uh, the comments, the questions that you shared, and I'm sorry we couldn't get to them all. There were so many in the chat, but those comments and questions will uh, help the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th Shape Future programs. Uh, we've only just begun to scratch the surface on framing these community conversations and this dialogue on race. So stay tuned for more details as our community conversations will continue in the new year. Now, for more information about the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th, past and future programs, updates on the status of the restoration project and target date of the memorials return to Beacon Hill, please visit Shaw 54th Memorial Restoration.org. That's Shaw 54th Memorial Restoration.org. The web address is listed in the chat and posted on the Friends of the Public Garden Facebook page. You'll also find there a wonderful array of archival television, radio, and print media coverage, as well as historical information related to the memorial. Uh, before we close, let me share some good news. Everyone in the Shaw 54th Zoom room has been entered in a drawing for a swag bag with goodies from all of the partners to renew the Shaw 54th. And I'm happy to inform you that the 54th person to register for each event from the August conversation through the rededication will receive these gift bags. And on that note, I'm pleased to announce that the recipient of the swag bag for our August community conversation is Claire Cochran. And tonight's recipient is Patrick Hannafin. Congratulations to everyone. One final note, as Cheryl Clyburn Crawford said, Please remember to vote November 24th, October 24th is the last day to register to vote in Massachusetts. Check the chat for links to more voter information for Massachusetts and across the country. And if possible, please vote early to let your voice be heard before election day, November 3rd. I am uh, going to leave with this. I am masked but not silenced. Vote everyone. Have a great evening. Be well, stay safe. We'll see you again.